you know, we rehearsed and prepared questions, etc. But you will allow me to move a little bit away from the written questions for a minute because I think everybody is interested to hear about your perspective, what's going on in Ukraine as far as the cyber situation. How do you see it? How strategic it is? What are the options? How to deal with it? How it will affect the new state of the world so to first, begin with? Uh, so first in Ukraine in the last week we saw a huge increase in cyber attacks. By the way, like the previous uh, Russian attack, it started before the physical forces got in the night before there was a cyber attack and that was the sign that uh, the war is starting. Uh, we saw about, uh, I think, 194% increase on attack on Ukraine. Um, we saw, we stopped our last first day, we stopped uh, seven zero-day attacks that we are very proud that we were able to stop because we know that no other tool would have stopped them. So and it's all on government uh, institutions in Ukraine. So clearly there's a use of uh, cyber in that uh, war. Uh, I don't think it's to the full extent that's uh, possible or expected. And there's a good reason and there's, I mean, I can speculate why, but it's, uh, but definitely cyber is being used. And how how you think it will affect the, the end results of the conflict? First, I don't know it will affect the end results of the conflict if the cyber is the main challenge. Uh, by the way, I think that one of the reasons that uh, maybe the cyber tools are not used to the full extent because the, the different sides don't want to burn their tools. And one of the things that create that uh, cyber uh, that cyber tools uh, enjoy and suffer is once they are being used, uh, many people can replicate them. So, for example, the Russian might have a lot of uh, fighter jets and they can be used war after war. Uh, if they use their most uh, advanced cyber attack tools, the next, it's very easy within days, we can develop protections to stop or not, we can develop. Some sites can use these tools to stop them. And these, by the way, even worse, these tools will be now by the hands of every terrorist, every kid, every organization in the world. So it's not that just one big nation will be able to use its tools, but everybody will be able to use these tools. Again, I know that it will be very hard to answer the next question, but just as a general idea, how would you rate the proficiency of Ukraine in cyber? The Ukrainian, are, I think in general, there is a very good talent there. They are very smart. They have a lot of good people in cyber. Uh, is the nation prepared against cyber attack? I will tell you the truth. No nation today is prepared against cyber attacks. Nations around the world are investing in intelligence, are investing in, uh, in attack tools. That's a big investment. Uh, I don't think... We heard sing- something about it. I recently. don't think that a single nation in the world today protects itself against cyber attack. It's, uh, it's something that I'm trying to promote for many years, but I must tell you, must admit that there is the level of readiness amongst government around the world for that is still very low. And what do you, th- what do you think will be the conclusion of uh, this uh, conflict in that respect? How it will affect the I think future that everybody of un- I think that everybody understands that we need to be more prepared, more ready against cyber attacks. Again, I don't know if Ukraine changes that perception or not. Uh, or I mean, every, actually, every day that passes accelerates that. We saw the example of the colonial pipeline. Here in Israel, we had multiple attacks on our uh, water infrastructure, on our hospitals, on uh, public mm-hmm. companies that just had personal data of uh, citizens. And again, it's not critical infrastructure, but our identity as citizens is critical infrastructure. And I think we learn every day that we need to um, protect our world. Now, as far as I remember, you call the current cyber generation like fifth or sixth generation, right? Yeah, we are now in the fifth generation of cyber attack for the last two years. If two years ago, fifth generation cyber attack were, I wouldn't say rare, but they were advanced. In the last year we saw, I mean, every week we saw a new type of fifth generation cyber attack. And these are attack, by the way, just for those that are not familiar with the terminology, fifth generation cyber attacks are usually uh, 
polymorphic, so they are hard to identify through signatures or through watching them in the past. They are multi-vector, so they may get from one point, move around, and then attack only at a later stage, and I think that's what we've seen too. Uh, they use very advanced tools, and uh, they can cause a lot of damage. So I think we've definitely seen all the recent attacks that we've seen were fifth generation cyber attacks, quite sophisticated, hard to identify, use zero day techniques, and uh, unfortunately, most of the world protects itself around, I would say, Gen 3, Gen 3 and a half, maybe Gen 4 attacks. Can you very quickly try and go very quickly, one generation, one, two, three, four, five, six, what are the, the characteristic of each generation? So the first generation were the simple viruses, and they exist for a little bit more than 30 years, a file that attacks your computer. Second generation already introduced the network. If you remember, the first viruses came into the companies through diskette, through copying software, didn't use the network, the yeah. networks didn't exist. Second generation, which where we started the checkpoint in the mid-90s, that was the attacks that come through the network. So somebody is using the network, hitting on a server, hitting on a computer, and penetrating it. That's second generation. Third generation already use very sophisticated uh, uh, vulnerabilities in applications. So it's not just getting from the network to something that's unprotected. It's already using some bug in application. The fourth generation already encapsulate that in something that gets through and it's very hard to identify, usually what I call polymorphic, so the attack is not something that we've seen before, and every time, this, actually the same attack, every time learn, I mean, of course, again, for me that I started my career when there was no internet, and with the internet revolution, coming here and saying how great is the revolution, and we've just learned the last two years how the world moves from physical to, you know, I mean, we're all dependent on the internet, but we also had the physical world. The last two years, we've shifted almost completely to the internet, and I think we should be all be very, very proud that it worked. But I have to ask you a personal question. You know, you really dedicated your life, your brain, your effort, your passion to resolve the issue. When you started, the issue was very small. Now, how many years? 25, 30 years later? 28, 29 years. 29 years. The, the problem is much bigger, so maybe it's because of you it became such a big issue. <laughs> uh, I think for, because of us and people like us, this community that's here in this conference, it's become manageable. I think what became much, much bigger is the internet and our dependence on the internet. 30 years ago, for me, the revolution of sending an email and having somebody in America receives the message or send me a response within seconds was a big revolution. You know, watching the news, not on the local TV or the local news, but watching global news on the internet was a revolution. Uh, today, it's part of our life. We can't imagine our life without it. And again, the last two years taught us how dependent we are on cyber and on the internet because we move to do everything. You know, our social life, consume media, e-commerce, uh, managing our critical infrastructure. I mean, our world now, for people in our industry, we're going to work in a hybrid world. The, the office is going to have a completely new role in the future of uh, our world, and it's all the internet. So I think when I started Checkpoint, I said it's going to revolutionize the world. That was, I was right. Where I was wrong, I think what I imagine in revolutionizing the world was maybe between maybe one percent of what the internet became today. The revolution is a hundred, at least a hundred times bigger than what I could imagine the 30 years ago. By the way, what people don't know, you heard me mentioning it many times. Uh, Gil not only pioneered the the firewall. I think this was your first product, but he, as far as, I, as I'm concerned, he was the first user of voice over IP that I met in my life. That's true, yes. You demonstrated it to us, yes. Yeah, you demonstrated it. <laughs> I came to see the you demonstration. Came to see it in our yeah. offices, yes, from Vocaltech. But again, this is, again, you look at all this revolution, you say, cool, you can use voice over the internet, and now, I mean, 90% of the calls we make on the phone are voice over IP, and the dependency on video and Zoom and so on, this is this yeah, was our it's, life it's in the really, last few years. It's really changed the whole, it's, it's actually disrupted the whole telecom industry. You know? yeah. 
Uh, let me go to the question again that we repeat it every two years, but it's time to ventilate it again. So the issues are big. You say they are manageable. I wonder what does it mean that they're manageable. They're manageable by whom? By companies which can have 200 people in their cyber department, but the shopkeeper in the corner, uh, in the street corner, in the neighborhood, is getting lost. So between government and between small businesses, how you deal with 7 by 24 by 365, how you, how you cope with this terrible monster? So I think that the challenge of cybersecurity needs to be addressed in all these dimensions. Nations need to, to promote the nationwide security, to promote the, the the infrastructure and the public. Individuals need to use the basic tools for consumers. Small businesses need to use the right tool for small businesses, and big businesses need to use the right tool. There are certain things that are common. I think today you'll see, and you see here in this conference, there's plenty of great technologies, amazing companies. Our industry needs more consolidation. I mean, it's evident. Nobody can build this solution based on 12 or 50 or 55 solutions, yeah. not, an in, not a consumer and not a big company. Um, it's clear to me, and that's, I mean, sounds clear and it sounds obvious, but that's not what most people in the industry promote, that we need technologies that prevent the attack. Most of the technologies you'll see outside here talk about attack detection and some did talk about remediation, how we fight, how we, how we remediate the situation and so on, that's not enough. Once you've been attacked in cyber, it's way, way too late. Uh, in some cases, you can remediate. In some cases, the damage is way too big and it's too far. So I think my two principles in what we're trying to promote in Checkpoint is consolidation, one architecture that can yeah. fight everything. We want, we want one stop solution. So I'll, I'll give you an example that Guy, really... please repeat after me. We mm -hmm. want one-stop solution. One, two, three. One-stop solution. Great, we'll hire you to our marketing. But let me tell you a real story that's happened <laughs> I to don't us, want uh, to be your marketing. I want to do what to do with my phone and what, how to explain to my I, I, wife. I'll, I'll give you a real-world story because we were engaged with a big, uh, actually, city. And for years, we were trying to promote our, what we call the infinity total protection, our full architecture that secures an entire entity. In December, we signed the contract, we shook hands, we were very happy that we signed these contracts. And usually these contracts, once you sign them, it takes a year or two years to implement them. Interestingly enough, this city started the first installation the next day. We installed our software on a few PCs, on a few laptops. Immediately the first hour, one of the laptops, it was one of the administrators, had a malware on it. Now again, this is usually not the end of the world. One malware in a big 8,000 seat organization is not the end of the world, but it turns out because we were there, because we were able to see what we found and the previous technologies didn't found, that it was a real attack, not only on the laptop, but all over their infrastructure, on their directory servers, on their mail servers, and so on. In, within hours, we turned the, the protection from the endpoint to the network, so the patterns that we saw on the endpoint were stopped on the network. We stopped 90,000 attack attempts from within the network, in and out the network to the operators. Within a week, we were able to install our full architecture, cloud network, email servers, 8,000 uh, computers. We were able to keep the network up. It was very painful over the weekend. We but because they had the malware there for three, four months, we had to help them reformat and reinstall all their mail servers. And I think this was a big achievement because it shows, A, every organization you get to has a very high chance of being infected. We showed us and we showed this customer, this big city, that uh, you can actually fight the attack. And it doesn't take a year and a half. Within a week, you can take an 8,000-seat organization that has everything organization has, public service to the citizens, internal system, call centers, all of that, and secure it from the beginning to the end on all the layers. So this is doable. Now, put your hand on your heart 
and tell me the truth. Put your hand on your heart. Which one were, you, were you the guy who put the original malware on that computer? Never, ever. That's uh, not... Uh, <laughs> believe me, it was very, very... This was, uh, for us, it was a big operation. We are not even used to that because we usually not the service providers and so on. We have plenty of great partners around the world. We do that. But I'm, I'm very proud of all the people in Checkpoint because we were able to do everything, you know, from installing mail servers and upgrading them. Um, to bringing, by the way, corona test because we didn't want our people to be... Well, this was the, the end of the... Sorry, to did. today you see what's going on here. You know, we have here in the conference 10,000 people. How do you see on the day? What, 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 what is your feeling about how the industry developed so far and where do you think the, the Israel industry is going? I think first it's amazing. I saw statistics the last few days that like... 40% of the investment in cyber are down in Israel, number one in the world, not number two. More investment from Checkpoint. So I feel like a very proud, you know, father or grandfather of a huge family. Uh, as I said, there is challenges, there is, needs to be consolidation, there needs to be, but I think in Israel, we did develop a real powerhouse for cyber, and I think the world needs it, and I think fortunately everybody agrees that uh, for many, many years we're still going to have a lot of demand for good cyber technologies. And a couple of times this year, Amir and Dror wanted to focus on the contribution to the, in the, to, to the, the contribution of the industry, not only to the cyber uh, space, but also to some social issues like uh, uh, inclusion, diversity, uh, more, more less less homogeneous uh, players. You know the issues. Can you very quickly tell us what uh, what uh, Checkpoint is doing in this uh, in, the, in those areas? So I think it would be long if I'll say that, but as a company, we're very much promoting it, from supporting education in early stages to our employees. I mean, again, two years ago, before the corona, when you walked into our dining room, it was amazing because you can see all the people of Israel society together, from ultra-Orthodox to Arabs, all working together, sitting together, sharing the world. I think technology is a good world for inclusion. The demand is such that we have a big motivation to promote everybody to participate. The, uh, <clears throat> the market is global, so there is no advantage for one or the other. It is an open market, so we should be open to the world. And I think, in general, that's a great market to promote these uh, principles. I think our industry as a whole does, does a lot. I think we can do more. Um, and I think, by the way, one more thing that it does promote is the value that if you get good education, if you study, and if you go for sciences, you'll be successful in life. Now again, you can be successful in high tech, you can be successful in cyber, you can be successful in many other things, but learning education and learning science, uh, I mean, education and science are good things to the society in general, and I think we see a lot of interest from that, from you know, the younger generation of all ages. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Gil Schweitz. Thank you.